Good to see you, Cloud. Welcome to Mojo Plays, and today we're looking back at the history of Sephiroth, where he came from, what he did, and what he was capable of doing. This is the villain origin of Sephiroth. This should go without saying, but a spoiler warning ahead. Before we continue, we publish content all week long, so be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified of our latest videos. To make the timeline of Sephiroth easier, we will be discussing all of Sephiroth's appearances in chronological order, rather than the order in which the games and film were released. That being said, we will make one exception by quickly mentioning his first official appearance now, before we jump back in time. There probably isn't a gamer alive who doesn't at least know the name Sephiroth, appearing in not only Final Fantasy, but also in games like Kingdom Hearts and Super Smash Bros. But before these entries, Sephiroth got his start by appearing as the main villain of the game he is most well known for, Final Fantasy VII. That might have sounded like a very condescending and obvious sentence, but let's pretend like some of our viewers know nothing before you masamune me through the pee hole. For fans of Final Fantasy VII Remake, you may not know that in the original 1997 game, it wasn't until after leaving Midgar and making your way to Calm that Sephiroth made his first on-screen appearance. When Cloud discusses his history with Sephiroth, we enter the now-famous Nibelheim flashback sequence, which shows us who Sephiroth was, what he became, and how he became it. But we'll talk more about that later. The takeaway here is that Sephiroth was mentioned for a lot of the Midgar section, but was never actually seen, as opposed to the remake where he is seen constantly. The only thing the player saw was the path of destruction he left, creating this sense of dread leading up to his eventual appearance, and then surprise that he seemed to be just a man. But what kind of man is capable of lifting a three-story giant serpent into the air and skewering it with a tree? Sephiroth, that's who. Sephiroth's Younger Years. With the information provided within the games, we know that Sephiroth was born somewhere between 1977 and 1982. Sephiroth was the product of Professor Hojo's Project S, one of the projects under Professor Gast's Genova project, begun under false assumptions that Genova was a Cetera. There are so many names and words there that are important to fully understand the world surrounding Sephiroth. So throughout this video, we're going to adopt a quick fire rule where I can quickly try to rattle off hours worth of lore in a matter of seconds, and you guys aren't allowed to leave me in comments when I skip over stuff to keep this video cohesive. You got it? Okay, let's go. Professor Hojo, who ran the Project S, is a significant antagonist in Final Fantasy VII, even though his appearance there is obviously years after Sephiroth's birth, and he is an adult in Final Fantasy VII. Professor Gast worked closely with Hojo, and although was a major player in the questionable Project S, he was still considered morally good. Genova is an ancient organism that was retrieved to use in Project S to create another Cetra like her, although, as we previously mentioned, it was later revealed that Genova was in fact not a Cetra, and they had been working under false information. And Cetra, otherwise known as ancients, are an ancient civilization of people who are now long dead. There are so few people with Cetra blood in their veins that a good chunk of Final Fantasy VII antagonist activity is dedicated to kidnapping Aerith, who is half Cetra. <sighs> okay, back to Sephiroth's conception. Lucretia Crescent, the assistant to Professor Hojo on the project, conceived Sephiroth while Hojo injected the cells of Genova onto Sephiroth while she was still pregnant, with the goal of creating a human with ancient abilities. Without even having the chance to hold her own child, Lucretia and Sephiroth were instantly separated after his birth. Although Sephiroth didn't gain the abilities of an ancient as envisioned, he was deemed a superior subject to Genesis and Angeal, two other babies conceived under similar circumstances, and research on Project S continued into the development of Soldier. Wait a minute, Matt, what the heck is Soldier? Well, my jubbly little friends, according to Wikipedia, Soldier is the elite fighting force of Shinra Electric Power Company in the Final Fantasy VII universe. Its members are advanced super soldiers with superhuman strength, speed, and agility, much stronger than the Shinra peacekeeping troops and the two Turks, Shunra deploys soldier for special missions that require the greatest use of strength. Some call me lazy, I call me efficient. And lazy. Sephiroth's upbringing and education all took place under Hojo's guidance, where he observed the belief that a proficient soldier must possess strength in body, mind, and spirit, viewing a steely resolve devoid of hesitation as signs of true strength. 
To instill this, Hojo subjected Sephiroth to intense physical suffering, pushing him to endure just a criminal amount of agony to unlock his full potential. It doesn't take an advanced degree in family psychology to know that if you raise a child in this environment, they're probably going to grow up with a passionate interest in taxidermy. Luckily, Sephiroth skipped all that and went straight to cutting people up on the battlefield. Sephiroth's first field assignment was to the archipelago of Rador, once a Shinra ally. His first engagement involved swiftly dispatching a legion of Rodoran soldiers upon helicopter insertion. The soldier team already engaging in this battle were made up of veterans from Project Zero, Glenn Lodbrock, Matt Winsett, and Lucia Lin. These are some of the original soldiers and Sephiroth on his first field assignment wiped out their enemy in a matter of moments. Due to his immense power and ability, Sephiroth took command of the team and led them in infiltrating an underground Redoran base within the Logos Ruins. Throughout this mission, he grappled with the dissonance between Shinra's idealized heroism and his personal desires for familial connection and normalcy, and in particular, finding his mother. As the harsh realities of conflict weighed heavily on his conscience, Sephiroth found solace and guidance from his comrades who encouraged him to wield his considerable power with empathy. His bond with Glenn and the team alongside interactions with the Redora and Rosen played a pivotal role in shaping his character and future path. Now, I fully understand that this was a very quick way of explaining the deep and frustratingly intricate story of his younger years, and there is still so much we could dive into, and I'm still not totally convinced I shouldn't explain what Project Zero was, but if we don't move on, we'll be here all day. In summation, Sephiroth, strong. But it's not fair because he was juicing in the womb. Let's move on. Sephiroth the war hero. Showing your back to the enemy. Overconfidence will destroy you. <sighs> Sephiroth rose to notoriety as a celebrated war hero across the globe, handpicked to serve as the face of a Shinra recruitment campaign aimed at sourcing candidates for the prestigious soldier program. This recruitment program and Sephiroth himself were at this time grabbing the attention of a little known video game protagonist by the name of Cloud Strife, who would eventually join Shinra. Now, we're here to focus on Sephiroth, but it's worth mentioning Cloud at this point to show that the recruitment campaigns were working and grabbing the attention of small town folk like Cloud and Tifa. Even though Sephiroth displayed an otherworldly set of skills and strength, a myriad of achievements and honors were concocted to portray him as a hero long before he ever even set foot on the battlefield. They were all achievable for him, but fake nonetheless. Forging close bonds with fellow First Class Soldier members Genesis and Angeal, the trio frequently engaged in epic sparring sessions within the VR training room. During one such session, Genesis insisted on a one-on-one -on -one duel with Sephiroth, resulting in a minor injury that triggered his degradation. It's not worth our time to get into degradation as S-type soldiers like Cloud, Zack, and our dear boy Sephiroth do not suffer from degradation. It's G-type soldiers like Angeal and Genesis that do. So let's forget that word and focus on something else. Oh my god, look, Crisis Core! Isn't it shiny and cool, you guys? Let's look at that instead! Now that we're entering the era of Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core, we should talk briefly about Zack Fair. Zack Fair is a soldier you play as in Crisis Core. Okay, moving on. Zack is actually a major player in the lore of Final Fantasy VII, but the joke still works. During the final days of the Wutai War, Sephiroth intervened during Angel and Zack Fair's raid on Fort Tamblin. He rescued Zack from an Ifrit summoned by a Genesis clone, and it was here that Sephiroth suggested that both Genesis and Angeal had defected from Soldier and Shinra. Angeal was a close mentor of Zack, and this information left him in complete disbelief. Sephiroth defended the Shinra building against two assaults orchestrated by Genesis's forces. While tracking Angeal to Maka Reactor 5, Sephiroth proposed to Zack that they intentionally failed to neutralize him, a plan to which Zack enthusiastically agreed to. At the reactor, Sephiroth opened up to Zack about their shared history. In facing another assault targeting Hojo, Sephiroth and Zack defended, with Sephiroth maintaining a sarcastic facade of indifference when a perplexed Angeal came to their aid. Nibelheim Incident By the way, where are we going? To Nibelheim. Not only is the Nibelheim incident one of the most famous moments in Final Fantasy, but it's one of the most famous moments in all of gaming. 
The Nibelheim incident with the universe of Final Fantasy VII is the meeting point for a lot of different games, the overlapping point for many characters and many experiences, the end to some journeys, the beginning of others, the catalyst for events to follow, and the reason others came to a close. And for this video in particular, the Nibelheim incident may be the single most important moment in Sephiroth's story. Now, as it becomes clear in the original version of Final Fantasy VII, the Nibelheim incident is described and visited a couple of times each, with slightly different variations and claims from characters like Tifa that some versions of the story aren't accurate. It's not till the ending of Final Fantasy VII that we learn the true story. The variations in story, however, never really affect what Sephiroth experiences at Nibelheim. Whether it's the original telling or the final telling, Sephiroth follows essentially the same path. For this video, we're just going to focus on the truth and not the different versions of this story. So if you've yet to complete Final Fantasy VII, you may want to stop the video here. Towards the end of Crisis Core and six years before Final Fantasy VII, Sephiroth and Zack received orders to investigate the Nebel Reactor, where reports of missing workers and soldier operators, as well as the presence of numerous monsters, had surfaced. The investigation team consisted of Sephiroth, Zack Fair, and two infantrymen, one of whom was Cloud Strife. The team arrived in Nibelheim with Sephiroth inquiring about Cloud's feelings upon returning to his hometown. When Zack asked if Sephiroth had any family, Sephiroth evaded the question, simply stating that his mother's name was Genova. The group was guided up Mount Nebel to the Nebel reactor by a local named Tifa Lockhart, during which a villager took a photo of Sephiroth, Zack and Tifa. At the Marco reactor, Sephiroth and Zack discovered remnants of Professor Hojo's experiments, including pods filled with Marconoids and the pod at the top of the room containing Genova. Overwhelmed by the realization that he might have been created in a similar manner, Sephiroth experienced a breakdown. Genesis then appeared revealing Sephiroth's origins in the Genova project and asking for his assistance with his degradation. Sephiroth rejected Genesis and left for the Shinra Manor basement where he obsessively studied Hojo's project files for seven consecutive days. Sephiroth, believing himself to be the last of the Cetra and resentful towards humanity for an unspecified past disaster, unleashed his rage by setting Nibelheim ablaze, resulting in the deaths of many, including Claudia Strife and Brian Lockhart, the parents of Cloud Strife and Tifa Lockhart. Tifa, wielding Sephiroth's blade, Masamune, found beside her father's corpse, attempted to confront him, but was swiftly disarmed and wounded. Zack also engaged Sephiroth in combat, but was ultimately defeated, relinquishing his buster sword in the process. Seizing the opportunity, Cloud took up Zack's sword and struck Sephiroth while he was momentarily distracted. In the ensuing struggle, Cloud impaled Sephiroth with the Buster Sword and was then himself impaled by the Masamune Blade. Then, using sheer anger and strength, he lifted Sephiroth into the air and hurled him into the livestream. To conceal the truth of the incident, Sephiroth was declared killed in action while Professor Hojo utilized the unconscious Zack and Cloud for an experiment to test his reunion theory. Things get weird. Over the ensuing years, Sephiroth's consciousness traverses the life stream. The fragments of his essence congregated at the northern cave within the north crater, gradually reforming Sephiroth's physical form within a cocoon of Marco. From within, Sephiroth wielded control over Genova's cells, using them as an extension of his being to manipulate individuals injected with Genova cells, effectively turning them into Sephiroth clones under his sway. It's worth making clear from here on and for the majority of the original Final Fantasy VII that you only ever face clones of Sephiroth controlled by Sephiroth from his Marco cocoon at the North Crater. This fact isn't revealed till late in the game, but for all intents and purposes, Sephiroth faced death that day in Nibelheim and only lived on through the life stream for the events following. Basically, he sits on his ass for the rest of his story. Final Fantasy VII. Approximately five years after his presumed demise, Sephiroth initiated his scheme to manipulate the Sephiroth clones for his reunion, aiding him in merging with the livestream and seizing control of it to attain godhood. So many non-Final Fantasy fans or Final Fantasy haters will shake their head at this plot, exclaiming, what? What does that even mean? That doesn't make sense. That's so convoluted. And to those people, we say, are you a tiny baby? 
Towards the end of the Midgar section of Final Fantasy VII, Cloud and the gang storm the Shinra building, and it's in this section that Sephiroth uses the headless remains of Genova to manifest his form within the Shinra building, where he goes on to assassinate President Shinra, free Cloud's party, and leave a trail of destruction in his wake. This version of Sephiroth will here on out be referred to as Sephiroth Genova. Progressing northward, the Sephiroth Genova entity encountered and defeated a Midgar Zolom, with Cloud's party in pursuit. Remember? That's the snake getting pierced by the tree. Remember the thing I said at the start, guys? You still with me? Further into the game and aboard a cargo ship bound for Costa del Sol, Sephiroth Genova encountered Cloud's party but displayed no recognition of Cloud because, you know, he doesn't really know who Cloud is. And I just realized that information isn't pertinent right now because I didn't explain any of the fake flashback stories. Anyways, departing abruptly, he left behind a mutated arm of Genova, which transformed into Genova Birth. The next time Sephiroth Genova ran into them was when Cloud and the party visited Nibelheim and encountered Sephiroth Genova in the Shinra Manor basement where Genova urged Cloud to follow. I understand that we're jumping very quickly through Final Fantasy VII, but in my defense, the majority of that game is about Cloud and right now, we DGA f about Cloud. In search of the Black Materia, Sephiroth Genova targeted the Black Materia from the Temple of the Ancients, incapacitating Tseng and manipulating Cloud into relinquishing the artifact. Tseng is a member of the Turks, and I understand that's a group we've spent zero time explaining in this video. Anyways, Sephiroth revealed his grand plan to use the Black Materia to summon Meteor, compelling the planet to heal itself within the life stream, allowing him to merge with it and ascend to divinity, aka God status, aka Sefer Jesus, aka Big Daddy Seph Seph. With the Black Materia secured, Sephiroth Genova proceeded to the North Crater. Something else happens later in the game that involves Sephiroth Genova. What is it? Something big. Oh yeah, Sephiroth Genova stabs Aera through the f***ing back while she attempts to summon Holy, thwarting her efforts to save the planet. Aerith was in fact successful in summoning Holy, but Sephiroth's influence restrained its full potential till the reveal at the end of the game that it actually worked because ebbs and flows and storytelling and drama, you know. Sephiroth Genova engaged Cloud's party in combat within the Whirlwind Maze, ultimately discarding the Sephiroth Genova form in favor of Genova Death. In a final act of manipulation, Sephiroth coerced Cloud into surrendering the Black Materia to his cocoon form, summoning Meteor and awakening the planet's guardians known as weapons, before descending deeper into the crater. I should let you know, we've just jumped across about 10 hours of gameplay in a few sentences. The events culminate in the planet's judgment, where Cloud's party confronts Sephiroth at the core of the Northern Cave. Sephiroth reveals his bizarro Sephiroth and safer Sephiroth forms, engaging in a fierce battle against Cloud's party. Though defeated, Sephiroth's consciousness persisted, engaging Cloud in a metaphysical struggle for control until Cloud prevailed, causing Sephiroth to dissolve into the life stream. With Sephiroth vanished, Holy was released from the planet's core, aided by Aerith's spirit, effectively neutralizing Meteor and averting the catastrophe. The end. Right? Well, 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 just as we thought Sephiroth was dead and we could end this video, we reveal that once again, he continued living on, but this time through pure and unfiltered nerd spazzing, Advent Children. Sephiroth managed to evade dissolving fully within the live stream by channeling his intense hatred towards Cloud. As the live stream rose to confront the impending threat of Meteor, Sephiroth seized the opportunity by dispersing his memories into the live stream, thereby infecting the planet with Geostigma. Utilizing these fragmented memories, he orchestrated the creation of the remnants of Sephiroth, imbued with the memories others held of him, and dispatched them to seek out Genova's remains, facilitating his resurrection. This was the nerd rage I was talking about. In Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, the global spread of Geostigma ravaged the world. The remnants of Sephiroth, Loz, Kadaj, and Yuzu pursued Genova cells under the guise of reuniting with their mother, unknowingly serving Sephiroth's agenda. Kadaj, upon assimilating Genova cells, transforms into Sephiroth, marking the rebirth of the malevolent entity. Good to see you, Cloud. Sephiroth confronted Cloud once more amidst the ruins of Midgar, expressing disappointment at Cloud's recovery from Geostigma. Revealing his grand design, Sephiroth aimed to amass the souls of Geostigma's victims to corrupt the life stream and dominate the planet, intending to utilize it as a vessel for interstellar travel in his quest for domination over new worlds. I love Final Fantasy VII, but I'll admit it, Sephiroth's getting a little out of hand here. 
Despite heavily injuring Cloud by impaling him, Cloud ultimately emerges victorious, vanquishing Sephiroth. In his final moments, Sephiroth defiantly proclaimed his determination to transcend mere memory before fading into oblivion, leaving a weakened Kadaj to perish in his place. To wrap up this story, and with Sephiroth now defeated, Heir of Spirit invoked Healing Rain to cleanse the planet of Geostigma's taint. Congratulations, gang. Not only are we done with Sephiroth's story, but we also achieved my lifelong goal of ending a Mojo video with the word taint. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from Mojo Plays and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of our latest videos.